Shabbat Shalom. I have a ritual when I travel, and maybe you do too, of doing this quick count in my pockets. I'll go one, two, three, four. Does anyone else do that? To make sure that you have your wallet, your keys, your phone, your passport. No? Okay, well, then I'm unique. So I do this, and I go one, two, three, four. I make sure I have everything, and we're good to go. Uh, it's, it's not like a revolutionary practice, but I have found out that if I am missing something, sometimes the shortcut that I've created in my brain will replace the name of the object that I'm looking for with its corresponding number. So I go, I can't find two? I can't find my keys. I can't find two, I'll mumble under my breath trying to remember where my keys are. And on more than one occasion, some well-meaning co-travel companion has wanted to help me. And they'll go, oh, well, what are you looking for? And I'll go, uh, two. And they're like, what? And I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm looking for my keys. I know that this idea of replacing numbers and things doesn't sound particularly vital. But it is important. And we will come back to it. We'll be on the test at the end of service. So we are in Bamidvar, the book of Numbers, and it opens with this command from God to count the Israelites in the form of a census. And Moses has known that this request is coming because earlier in the book of Exodus, God told Moses that there will be a time when I'm going to need you to count the Israelites. And here is the method that I want you to use to count them. And the method of that counting requires that every person, and really what it says is every man of fighting age, to donate a half shekel of silver. And these silver coins are a great sign of equality among the Israelites because the commandment also says that no more shall be paid and no less. There's no ability to up the tribute to pay for more into the coffers so that your clan, your group, your tribe counts as more numerous or more influential. And similarly, there are no excuses. There are no deferments. Even the poorest in the people need to donate that single half silver coin. And by counting the coins that come in, each shekel, each half shekel representing a full person, this allows Moses to know exactly how many Israelites are in the nation. Now, this census counting is not, according to our sages, the first time that the Israelites have been counted en masse. There are 10 great countings of the Israelites in the Tanakh, and this is actually number four. The Israelites are counted first when they descend into Egypt, a second time when they come out, a third time right after the golden calf, this and the counting that will happen at the end of the book of Numbers are number four and five. Six and seven happen during the reign of King Saul. Eight is the cursed counting of David HaMelech, which we studied this morning in Torah study. Nine happens in the days of Ezra after the end of the first exile. And the tenth counting is the counting of the prophecy of Jeremiah who looks forward to a future of peace when, quote, the sheep shall pass once again under the hand of the one who counts them, thus says Adonai your God. Now that last one sounds especially lovely, but our sages are actually quite divided on the subject of counting the Jewish people and of counting Jews in general. There is in fact a strong taboo against counting people individually. And if you have ever attended an Orthodox minion, you may have seen this taboo in action. I have seen on more than one occasion the prayer leader go, not one, not two, not three, as they count off who is there to make minion. There is also the fun task of going, Baruch Ata Aronai Eloheinu Melech Olam Asher Kichanu Mitzvotav Vitzivanu. That's ten, and you can finish the prayer if you have the minion. And then another and final most common tradition is the recitation of the ninth verse of Psalm 20 people, uh, um, of Psalm 28, which says in the English, save your people, bless your inheritance, tend them and elevate them forever. And in the ancient Hebrew, it happens to be exactly 10 words long. And so you assign one word to one person, and if you can finish the psalm, you're ready to daven. But why? 
Why is there a taboo against counting when the Torah explicitly commands and the Tanakh records no less than nine full-scale countings of the Jewish people? One possible reason is based on those silver coins that I originally mentioned. There is a perspective that says a proper counting, as first described in Exodus, which I will remind us, once again, is that half a coin per person donating rather than the person themselves, is you count an item instead of counting a person. But that's just circular logic. It doesn't answer the question. We know we do it because we do it. So why is there a taboo against counting a person at all? Multiple opinions. One rabbinic sage argues that we are meant to be an innumerable people. That the great covenant described to Abraham, repeated to Jacob, says that your descendants shall be as numerous as the sand of the sea, as many as the stars in the sky. Try to count them if you can. So to attempt to count people is a bittelsman. It is a waste of time. For you are doing something which will ultimately be undone and be meaningless. That's one perspective. Perspective number two comes from Bava Metziah, a section of the Talmud, which teaches us that blessings are not to be weighed, nor measured, nor counted. Rather, they should remain hidden from your eyes. Which implies that things which are meant to be blessed, which, by the way, includes people, should not be counted or numbered. And that first, that idea of, well, don't count them, because if you don't count them, you won't know how many you have, and then you'll be blessed, sounds a little impractical or even perhaps superstitious to us. There's actually a lot of wisdom in that statement. When you think about relationships, especially, which are blessings in this world today, our relationships that we have between people, when they become based on numerical values, they quickly fray and they quickly tatter, because keeping score is a great way to break your heart. And so, if you keep count of every good deed that you do for someone else, if you keep count of every good deed, of every blessing that someone else does for you, it quickly turns into, well, I paid for this, so it's your turn to pay for that. Well, the last three times we did something that you wanted to do, so this time it should probably be my turn, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. My teacher, Rabbi Julie Schwartz, would always tell us that no relationship is perfectly balanced 50-50. Sometimes you give more, sometimes you take more, sometimes your friend does, sometimes your partner does, and if you're lucky, they end up 45, 55, 49, 51, 40, 60, but not always. Sometimes it's your turn to give. Sometimes it's your turn to take. But what matters is that you keep trying to be in relationship. Returning to the question of counting, though, a final rabbinic opinion against this taboo is based on the teachings of Rabbi Bachya ben Asher, who argues that when you single out one person to your own eyes, you also, as it were, put the magnifying glass of heaven on them. You single them out for divine judgment. And that not every single person at every single moment in their life is ready or capable of such inspection. There are moments where each of us carry incredible merit. And there are moments when we are not at our best. But, says the rabbi, when we are counted up as a community, even if we are judged, we always have the merit of everyone else on our side. He concludes, surely there are enough good deeds amongst the Jewish people that I am worthy of mercy. A contemporary opinion as to why we do not count people is related to Rashi's commentary on this verse from Exodus. Rashi argues that God loves the people of Israel so much and therefore counts them out of love so that God can know them, each of them, and so that God can have a special individual relationship with every person that is counted. This is the idea as the great 20th century theologian and philosopher Martin Buber would describe the I-thou or the I-you relationship. But most countings do not create I-you 
relationships or I-thou relationships, most countings create I-it relationships. They put you as a subject in direct relationship to me. And whether this is you and me personally, or you and me, my organization and you, or you and me, my ego and you. How many followers, for instance, do I have on social media is perfect emblematic representative of the I at relationship, accounting of bodies and not accounting of souls. And well, that's a little shallow. It's not innately harmful in any way, shape, or form until it goes one step further. Which brings me back to that little travel trick I was talking about at the beginning. When I replace my keys with the number two in my mind, nobody is hurt. They're just keys, and it's just the number two. I take a moment, I translate it back, and we move through the security. But when I completely replace a person in my mind with a number, well, then all sorts of terrible things can start to happen. When you stop being you and just become my 2,421st like or my 37th employee or the 10,017th member of my synagogue, if you stop being you and just become a faceless, numberless opponent to my ideals or my opinion or my perspective, well, then we have an issue. And that's what we're seeing right now in the Jewish world. It's what we're seeing right now, especially in Israel, as the fight over election reform continues. How many people agree, how many people disagree has become a massive talking point on both the right and the left. Yes, there are tens of thousands of people demonstrating in the streets, says the government, but there are millions more at home and they support us. Certainly, say the demonstrators, that was a strong showing of support for the government, but that was a one-time event. Not only do we outnumber them, we have the long-standing strength of a movement on our side. We are the ones with a mandate. Nonsense, says the elected official. The only mandate that exists is the one that was voted on at the polls. We have the votes, we have the power, that's what democracy means. And the opposition shakes its head and says, the power to rule does not give you the power to ensure that you only take care of people who voted for you. You are supposed to care for everyone, not just the people you want to count. How and what we count fundamentally changes which side we support and which side we respect in these ongoing issues. There is another sort of counting going on right now as well in our Jewish world, which is this, the final week of the Omer, which represents to us the arrival at Mount Sinai. Day by day, we have counted in an attempt to bring intentionality and awareness into the world. We have counted our way through chesed, kindness, gvura, strength, tiferet, beauty, netzach, endurance, hod, splendor, yisod, bonds. And now we are counting our way through malchut, which is nobility. Each week of the last 50 days has had a theme, and each day within it a focus. 50 lessons that we could embody and attempt to incorporate into our lives. And in this context, the practice of Omer counting reminds us that in Jewish space and time, yes, counting can be dehumanizing and taboo, but it can also be holy. It can also be just, and it can also lift up our souls. And so as we enter into this sacred week of Shavuot, this time of Matan Torah, this time of the giving of Torah and the blessings that come with it, may each of us incorporate the best aspect of this great counting into our lives. May we count the sacred relationships that come with being especially aware of each blessing and each blessed person in our lives. And may we avoid the pitfalls 
of reducing others around us to a role, to a function, or God forbid, just a number. Shabbat Shalom.